Now we've talked about the supply lines and now let's, let's look at what does that mean? What are the supply lines showing? Is there going to be a change? Is there any type of catch up? And I think it's important to just start with manufacturing supply delivery times is the longest since 1951. So we're in a period of time that we're supposed to have at time deliveries. We're supposed to have asset light capacity. And now we have the del- delivery times that is the lowest since 1951. Now, this is the average Z-score of delivery time surveys from Dallas Fed, ISM, Kansas City Fed, Philly Fed, and U.S. Empire State. And you can see that we're at 3.1. And that's the manufacturing delivery times when you look at the top being, uh, you know, the the worse and the bottom being better. You can see it's just this, again, is not something that is going away tomorrow because we have residual in the system in terms of delays, pressure, problems, underlying issues that will continue to cause that those prices. Now, one of the interesting things that we've heard when we look at TEUs and shipping, there's been comments that companies are like, at any cost, get this on a boat. And the boat has said, I can't, like, I just don't have room or I don't have the TEU. I don't have the container essentially for you. So I physically can't, no matter how much you're willing to pay me. And that is going to be a residual issue that doesn't get fixed overnight. You know, we were hoping to see a benefit or at least a catch up from that slowdown in the end of, uh, in, in, in March into April, but we just, we, it, there was just too much. And now we're coming into an accelerating point on, on a normal basis when we look at just activity and it's just going to become a much bigger problem that isn't going to go away anytime soon. So then when we look at the manufacturing PMI, because it's important to understand the, what is the PMI and then what are the backdrops of it. So manufacturing estimate was supposed to be at 61, came in at 60.6. Services was supposed to be at 61.5, came in at 63.1. And then the composite came in at 62.2, all of which are massively expansionary. I am not saying that they aren't, but there is there are pieces within that that have to be considered when you're looking at it in terms of met delivery times, prices paid, prices received, are going to send this much higher than they should be. Not to say that once you pack that out, you're, we're not still at 57 or 58, which is still an inherently bullish number and showing that strong growth. But we, we're seeing this growth. We've seen continuous growth if we look at just the PMIs, but we're being told that we continue to need support. We continue to need a lot of liquidity in the market because we're at a pivot point. Now, maybe that is true, but as the vaccines have accelerated, you know, what is that pivot point? And when do you turn around and say, okay, it's time to start taking some of this liquidity out of the market? Let's break it down a bit more. So the PMI incoming new business was really good. This is, again, one of those positive components. The, pro- the problem is this was good. New orders have been good. All of that has been good. But man- market U.S. manufacturing PMI input prices, going back to 2014, you can see every single month, it is just a step higher from where it is on input prices. Prices that, Now, that is going to start to slow. But it's not going to peak and fail. We're just, we're not seeing that right now because there's more residual issues that are happening in the market. And there's just this, this at all costs, bring this into my office, uh, in, into my, into my factory, factory. I don't have the capacity. Then you look at supplier delivery times. This is that huge drop off. You had that little bit of a bump, obviously, after the huge drop, which just offset itself. But every every week, every month, we're seeing a bigger and bigger step down as those delivery times continue to get worse and worse. Now, when we look at prices paid on, on raw materials, you can see we're right back to 2008, 2011, and we're actually at, at, at highs taking out those 08, 11 numbers. And just given the the shift up, it's based on all of the commodities that we look at, all of the different backdrops, we're just not seeing these big reversals. And then when we look at prices received for finished products, prices received continue to go up. And this is just now getting reflected in the system, which is why when we start looking at where is CPI going to go, where is it going to be? 
you're seeing this big step up and just based on the residual through the system, it's not going back down. Now, looking at it a bit differently, and, and it's a common thread, so we're not going to you know bemoan the same point, but new orders continue to be strong. Wages and benefits continue to, to rally on the Dallas side, but then when we look at manufacturing prices received of finished goods and prices paid, it's up and out. And that is going to continue to drive that inflation narrative and those fears in the market as we continue to see inflation getting pushed through the system. Now, the 12-month percent change in consumer price index, this is breaking it out into different pieces. So cereal and and bakery products, uh, 2.5%. Meats and poultry, almost uh, 6%. Dairy and related products, 1.5%. Fruits and vegetables, almost 4%. Non-alcoholic beverages at 3.5%. So when we look at the price index for March, all of those cereals, meats, all of those things are just going in one direction. And and, and I, I given there's a year over year, you know, we're not talking year over year. We want to talk what because this is looking at 12 month percent change in consumer price index. 12 months ago, a lot of these things got cheaper. But they're not as cheap as you'd expect because you did have people that were hoarding, you had people that had already maxed out. But when we look at the month over month, this, the same movements continue to move up, which is the problem in general when we're looking at what the underlying impacts to where inflation is going to go. So now that we, that we look at, okay, well, what about other pieces of the pie of inflation? Well, let's look at used vehicle value. Here you can see that uh, used cars going back to 1996 are the most expensive ever. That, 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 that speaks to the car shortage, that speaks to raw materials. We're continuing to see these prices only go up, which is becoming obviously, a, a, the whole basket is going to be looked at differently or should see some of that marked incre- those marked increases. Now, when we go to new home sales, even though we continue to see these prices driving higher, you can see here that new home sales in the West had a big reversal as everybody moves to the South. The South continues to be that home, that point. The Midwest continues to attract some. This is avoidance of taxes, uh, moving from that urban setting, you know, taking the opportunity to work from home, flex schedule, all of those things are enabling people to move to other locations which is resulting in a uh, shortage of home supplies. So here you can see those home supplies continue to go lower in general, which is just putting more and more pressure on the underlying system. So then when we look at, okay, well, almost no distressed home sales, this is the other problem that we're seeing in general. We're seeing pressure on supply, but we're also that moratorium on evictions, um, on, um, on short sales, that is leading to non-distressed home sales. So when we go from 2020 into 2021, you can see where it came into. And now there's just nothing. This is taking a huge chunk of distressed home sales out of the system, which is, again, just it would just bring more supply to market, which would help offset some of these increases. It's just we're not seeing that because of the uh, requirements in the system. Now, the S&P CoreLogic K-Shiller, uh, when you look at the K-Shiller home price index, is up 12% year over year in February versus 11.2% in the prior month. Prices climbed most since 2006 with low rates still boosting buying power. Now, this is just one. Let's look at the, the, uh, the total backdrop. So when we look at Case-Shiller, so the 20-city composite city home prices month over month was up 1.17%. When we look at purchase, the index purchase month over month was up 0.9% for the uh, FHFA. Then when we go to the year over year, composite was up 11.9%. And then U.S. national home prices. So the 20 city composite was up 11.94%. And the U.S. national home price year over year was up 11.97%. So the trend is moving in one direction. It continues to move in that direction. Based on everything that Powell has said, rates will remain low. So you'll still have that cheap 30 years. So you're still going to have cheap mortgages and you're still going to have commodity prices exploding, which is going to keep that bid within these houses. 
So then when we look at, okay, well, let's say 12 a month price changes prior year versus recent year, and you can see that they continue to rise. You know, so the FHFA February U.S. house prices for February 2021 up 3%, Mid-Atlantic division to 1.6% in the Mountain division. The 12-month changes range from 10.5% in the West North Central division to 15.4% in the Mountain division. So it's going up. I mean, there's there's just there's been no pause in these increases even though we continue to see this rise in inflation, these pressures that continue, the affordability, everybody keeps telling me how the Fed is factoring in and looking very closely at ways to close that in, the uh, income and quality gap, but yet we continue to see this push as making houses more and more expensive. So then when we look at the MBA purchase index, obviously moving to another all-time high, and then looking at it a bit differently, existing home sales medium price, the 2007 bubble peak of existing home sales medium price, and then the new level, the new high level. So we have completely blown through the 2017 bubble peak, and we are now just setting every month what seems to be just new all-time highs across the board. So then when we turn to U.S. mortgage equity withdrawal, this is the amount that people are looking to take out of their home. So total home equity cash out. So here's where people are taking cash out. Total volume of second mortgage has increased back to levels not seen since 2003. And then the total combined value. Now you have to consider what is the total home equity cashed out into. It's being cashed out into home improvement projects. So home improvement projects have only increased over the last few months and it continues to to drive high I'm not last few months the, the last you know essentially the last 2 years as people look to stay within their homes since 2019 and instead decided to just expand their current house. And we're still not at the, the peaks from 2000 from 2006 but it's at the same time, a lot of people have already done it. They might be underwater. They might have been back uh, back on top, and they're not in any hurry to do it. But clearly, prices have continued to go up, and just based on prices going up, this number is only also going in one direction. So then the rent changed from a year earlier. So rents obviously came down. You had people that had moratoriums, but now rents are starting to climb back up. Why? Because things have started to normalize. You have people that are paying higher prices. You have taxes that are going up. So people, you know, landlords are going to pass through some of these, these uh, increases over time. While all of this is happening, the conference board consumer, con- uh, the consumer confidence index continues to move back up. Consumer confidence is getting closer to pre-pandemic present ex- conditions and, and consumer expectations. Consumer ex- expectations is back to pre-COVID where present conditions is still, again, grinding higher. Now, what makes this up? What is the biggest driver for this? Well, when we look at future employment, present employment, those are all benefits of where we look at and then future business. Now, future income and present business still remain some of those headwinds, but the the view is that the future gets bright, things look better, especially as vaccines continue to roll out throughout the uh, the US. Now, when we look at US durable good orders, uh, when you look at the survey, the estimates were, were for 2.3%, but the actual is for 0.5. So why? Well, you had less people buy homes in February. You had that freeze off. You had a lot of issues. So then those orders were slow. I, I would expect to see some of these orders come back to a degree, but we're not going to get back to where we were again as how many times are you going to be able to buy or purchase some of these durable goods in general? And that's why we look at, well, what broke it down? So March weighted contributions to U.S. durable good orders, metal products, or other durable goods, machinery, but transportation. So transportation is a big one right now. And the I, I don't see transportation closing that gap in the near term, but I do see metal products and that machinery still maintaining some of that bid just based on the, some of those backdrops that we continue to see in the market. 
Now, when we look at U.S. durable good new orders, they've gone to a, a, a high going back to 2001. U.S. non-defense capital good orders, excluding aircraft, back to a high going all the way back to 2002. So there, there's some of there's some of these benefits in general that will remain in the system that will. Pr- that will keep durable goods from collapsing. It's just not that they're, we're going to see this big surge back up, but it will be supportive over the next few um, the next few few months, really. And U.S. credit and debit card spending. So you can see people are spending more. You're seeing online spending continuing to move up, and in store as those feel more confident, better getting back into the store and actually purchasing. But the shift has happened. E-commerce still remains the paramount way to do it. And you can see pre-COVID, it was still a a large part of in-store or in-store was, uh, you know, carrying weight and, and staying very close. But now after people were forced online, they realized they liked it. They realized that it was convenient. It was easy. There was it. And now you're seeing that remain in the system which speaks to what is gasoline demand going to look like? What is this recovery going to look like in oil demand as people have gotten used to doing more at home? And then when we look at the Richmond Manufacturing Survey, you can see that when on, on the composite side, we remain at 17, you know, still fairly strong, where employment rolled over a bit, but still remaining in expansionary territory, which leads us to the you know, some of the things that we talked about on Friday, where U.S. continuing uh, claims for unemployment, this is going to remain the problem, which was what we keep talking about. The pandemic unemployment assistance, extended benefits, pandemic emergency, where those are the things that are keeping people from, hey, I can go work as a busboy, I can go work as, 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 but I can also sit home and collect something that's going to pay me more. So why not? And I think that's going to become the biggest hindrance to, well, when do we start walking back some of these programs to incentivize people to go back? Or not to say that we just turn them off because you can't, you have to give people time to adjust. So you just cut some of that, that some of those, that money, you, you cut it down a bit, you cut it a little bit further, and then you, you give them some of this, you know, walk into so that they have time to adjust. Now, this is just breaking it out a bit differently where you can look at that pandemic emergency compensation unemployment assistance and just how elevated it is and how it really hasn't gone anywhere since May of, uh, of, since May of last year. We've been at the same level in general going back with little movement down instead of we've just flatlined. And you're seeing it here where when we look at April, and now this should get a little bit better, but that 17 point, we still remain over 17 million in net uh, benefit uh, people receiving benefits, which is why when we look at the low wage worker hit harder on the slower recovery, this is when we start talking about, well, how much spending are we going to see? What is that going to look like? Because business closures and voluntary consumer behavior change made in response to the spread of the virus hit sectors and occupations employing lower skilled workers and minorities the hardest. Employment and low wage jobs with earnings less than $15 an hour remains 15, 14% below pre pandemic levels. This contrasts with high wage jobs with earnings more than $40 an hour, where employment has grown 9% over the course of the pandemic. So, this is that bifurcation, these issues that, can, that we continue to see as a residual in the market that is going to impact some of that longer term spending and consumer movements, which is something that we think is going to mute some of the recovery, not all of it, because obviously there's, there's still something to be said about it, but this is going to be some of those bigger things that I think need to be looked at and considered when we talk about what this recovery looks like over the longer term.